implied that the length of the diagonal was a number whose square was 2. The Pythagoreans assumed that the answer would be a fraction. But when Hippasus tried to express it in this way, no matter how he tried, he couldn't capture it. Eventually, he realised his mistake. It was the assumption that the value was a fraction at all which was wrong. The value of the square root of 2 was the number that the Babylonians etched into the Yale tablet. However, they didn't recognise the special character of this number. But Hippasus did. It was an irrational number. The discovery of this new number, and others like it, is akin to an explorer discovering a new continent, or a naturalist finding a new species. But these irrational numbers didn't fit the Pythagorean world view. Later Greek commentators tell the story of how Pythagoras swore his sect to secrecy, but Hippasus let slip the discovery and was promptly drowned for his attempts to broadcast their research. But these mathematical discoveries could not be easily suppressed. Schools of philosophy and science started to flourish all over Greece, building on these foundations. The most famous of these was the Academy. Plato founded this school in Athens in 387 BC. Although we think of him today as a philosopher, he was one of mathematics' most important patrons. Plato was enraptured by the Pythagorean worldview and considered mathematics the bedrock of knowledge. Some people would say that Plato is possibly the most influential figure um, for our perception of Greek mathematics. He argued that mathematics is an important form of knowledge and does have a connection with reality. So by knowing mathematics, we'll know more about reality. In his dialogue Timaeus, Plato proposes the thesis that geometry is the key to unlocking the secrets of the universe a view still held by scientists today. Indeed, the importance Plato attached to geometry is encapsulated in the sign that was mounted above the academy. Let no one ignorant of geometry enter here. Plato proposed that the universe could be crystallised into five regular symmetrical shapes. These shapes, which we now call the platonic solids, were composed of regular polygons assembled to create three-dimensional symmetrical objects. The tetrahedron represented fire. The icosahedron, made from 20 triangles, represented water. The stable cube was earth. The eight-faced octahedron was air. And the fifth platonic solid, the dodecahedron, made out of 12 pentagons, was reserved for the shape which captured Plato's view of the universe. Plato's theory would have a seismic influence and continue to inspire mathematicians and astronomers for over 1,500 years. In addition to the breakthroughs made in the academy, mathematical triumphs were also emerging from the edge of the Greek Empire and owed as much to the mathematical heritage of the Egyptians as the Greeks. Alexandria became a hub of academic excellence under the rule of the Ptolemies in the 3rd century BC and its famous library soon gained a reputation to rival Plato's academy. The kings of Alexandria were prepared to invest in uh, the arts, in culture, in technology, mathematics, grammar, because patronage for uh, cultural pursuits was one way of showing that uh, you were a more prestigious ruler and had a better entitlement to greatness. The old library and its precious contents were destroyed when the Muslims conquered Egypt in the 7th century. But its spirit is alive in a new building. Today, the library remains a place of discovery and scholarship. Mathematicians and philosophers flocked to Alexandria driven by their thirst for knowledge and the pursuit of excellence. The patrons of the library were the first professional scientists, individuals who were paid for their devotion to research. But of all those early pioneers, my hero is the enigmatic Greek mathematician Euclid. We know very little about Euclid's life. 
but his greatest achievements were as a chronicler of mathematics. Around 300 BC, he wrote the most important textbook of all time, The Elements. In The Elements, we find the culmination of the mathematical revolution which had taken place in Greece. It's built on a series of mathematical assumptions called axioms. For example, a line can be drawn between any two points. From these axioms, logical deductions are made and mathematical theorems established. The elements contains formulas for calculating the volumes of cones and cylinders, proofs about geometric series, perfect numbers and primes. The climax of the elements is a proof that there are only five platonic solids. For me, this last theorem captures the power of mathematics. It's one thing to build five symmetrical solids, quite another to come up with a watertight logical argument for why there can't be a sixth. The elements unfold like a wonderful logical mystery novel. But this is a story which transcends time. Scientific theories get knocked down from one generation to the next. But the theorems in the elements are as true today as they were 2,000 years ago. When you stop and think about it, it's really amazing that it's the same theorems that we teach. We may teach them in a slightly different way, or we may organize them differently, but it's Euclidean geometry that is still valid, and even in, in higher mathematics. When you go to higher dimensional spaces, you're still using Euclidean geometry. Alexandria must have been an inspiring place for the ancient scholars, and Euclid's fame would have attracted even more eager young intellectuals to the Egyptian port. One mathematician who particularly enjoyed the intellectual environment in Alexandria was Archimedes. He would become a mathematical visionary. The best Greek mathematicians, they were always pushing the limits, pushing the envelope. So Archimedes did what he could with uh, polygons, with uh, solids. He then moved on to centers of gravity, or he then moved on to the spiral. Um, this instinct to try and mathematize everything is something that uh, I see as a legacy. One of Archimedes' specialities was weapons of mass destruction. They were used against the Romans when they invaded his home of Syracuse in 212 BC. He also designed mirrors which harnessed the power of the sun to set the Roman ships on fire. But to Archimedes, these endeavours were mere amusements in geometry. He had loftier ambitions. Archimedes was enraptured by pure mathematics and believed in studying mathematics for its own sake and not for the ignoble trade of engineering or the sordid quest for profit. One of his finest investigations into pure mathematics was to produce formulas to calculate the areas of regular shapes. Archimedes' method was to capture new shapes by using shapes he already understood. So for example, to calculate the area of a circle he would enclose it inside a triangle. And then by doubling the number of sides on the triangle, the enclosing shape would get closer and closer to the circle. Indeed, we sometimes call a circle a polygon with an infinite number of sides. But by estimating the error of the circle, Archimedes is in fact getting a value for pi, the most important number in mathematics. However, it was calculating the volumes of solid objects where Archimedes excelled. He found a way to calculate the volume of a sphere by slicing it up and approximating each slice as a cylinder. He then added up the volumes of the slices to get an approximate value for the sphere. But his act of genius was to see what happens if you make the slices thinner and thinner. In the limit, the approximation becomes an exact calculation. But it was Archimedes' commitment to mathematics that would be his undoing. Archimedes was contemplating a problem about circles traced in the sand when a Roman soldier accosted him. Archimedes was so engrossed in his problem that he insisted he'd be allowed to finish his theorem. But the Roman soldier was not interested in Archimedes' problem 
and killed him on the spot. Even in death, Archimedes' devotion to mathematics was unwavering. By the middle of the first century BC, the Romans had tightened their grip on the old Greek Empire. They were less smitten with the beauty of mathematics and were more concerned with its practical applications. This pragmatic attitude signalled the beginning of the end for the great library of Alexandria. But one mathematician was determined to keep the legacy of the Greeks alive. Hypatia was exceptional, a female mathematician and a pagan in the piously Christian Roman Empire. Hypatia was a very prestigious and very influential in her time. She was a, um, a teacher with a lot of uh, students, a lot of followers. She was uh, politically influential in Alexandria. So it's this combination of uh, uh, high knowledge and high prestige that may have made her um, a figure of hatred for uh, um, the Christian mob. One morning during Lent, Hypatia was dragged off her chariot by a zealous Christian mob and taken to a church. There she was tortured and brutally murdered. The dramatic circumstances of her life and death fascinated later generations. Sadly, her cult status eclipsed her mathematical achievements. She was in fact a brilliant teacher and theorist, and her death dealt a final blow to the Greek mathematical heritage of Alexandria. My travels have taken me on a fascinating journey to uncover the passion and innovation of the world's earliest mathematicians. It's the breakthroughs made by those early pioneers of Egypt, Babylon and Greece that are the foundations on which my subject is built today. But this is just the beginning of my mathematical odyssey. The next leg of my journey lies east in the depths of Asia, where mathematicians scaled even greater heights in pursuit of knowledge. With this new era came a new language of algebra and numbers, better suited to telling the next chapter in the story of maths. You can learn more about the story of maths with the Open University at open2.net. And the story of maths continues here on BBC4 next Monday at the same time. Next tonight, British novelists become agents of provocation as they describe a time when nothing was sacred in their own words. <laughs>